Well, we have something a little bit different for y'all today, and I'm excited about it. My wife says that uh, me saying ex I'm excited is like saying water is wet. <laughs> but I was recently interviewed for a podcast, uh, a leadership podcast, and they're surprised. They had a, a bonus question at the end that they didn't tell me what it was going to be. They just said bonus question. And the bonus question was, is water wet? And I said, no. I believe that wetness, which is not a word but should be, is the result of water on something else, not water itself. And that's my way of saying my wife is wrong. <laughs> uh, Pastor Chris is going to come share with us this morning. He and I are tag team preaching this morning, which we have never done before, but it's been a lot of fun. And so, who knows, maybe we'll do it again. And uh, when he gets done, he's just, going to, he's just going to stage dive right off of here, so y'all be ready, okay? That's, that's what people do. Pastor Chris, <laughs> take it away. Uh, I will not be crowd surfing, so uh, <laughs> front row, you are welcome. Well, my name is Chris. I'm the pastor of Student Ministries here at McCord Road Christian Church. If you're new here, I just want to say thank you again for coming to this service. I believe that God's going to speak to you in a powerful way. And if you open up your heart and your ears to what God has for you today in a special way, I think it could change your life. I think it could change your life when you walk out of this room and you will understand that you have a destiny. You know, a number of months ago, Pastor Micah talked about this message from his book uh, entitled Noel, and he said that everybody has a God-designed destiny that is waiting to be birthed inside of us. And I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that we all have a destiny that is waiting to come to fruition in each of us. And the interesting thing is, is that destiny could be sitting next to you. That destiny could be in your workplace. That destiny could, dare I say, be at the home or the neighbor that is living right next to you. And you probably will say, Pastor Chris, well, what if I don't like my neighbor? Then I'll say, you need Jesus. That's funny right there. That's what Pastor Micah would say, I tell you. You know, it's interesting, a number of years ago when I, I was a kid, um, my mom um, just had a heart to serve people. And if you've ever met my mom, you would know how she just embraces people. She loves to give big hugs, and she's just there for um, as many people as she possibly can. Um, but then when she goes home, she likes to rest, and she likes to shut the doors and relax, okay? And so does my dad. But it's interesting, um, I remember growing up, we had this neighbor that lived across the street, and he just knew how to show up at our home unexpectedly. Do you guys have that name? Well, don't, don't say that you do, because uh, they may be sitting next to you. Um, but this neighbor would walk across the street, and I remember um, my dad would pull into the driveway after a long day of work, and he would be working on a car, and my mom would just be getting home as well. And then all of a sudden, that neighbor just opens up the gate, and then I remember my mom just peeking out the window and just being like, oh my goodness, he's back again. And see, maybe you have that neighbor where you camouflage behind the blinds, or you army roll on the ground and try to cover yourself so you don't get noticed by that one person that is knocking at your door. And you know what's interesting about that is that we all have these neighbors or these people that show up unexpectedly in our lives. And the, and the great thing about my parents is they took it as an opportunity to sow seeds. And how they sowed seeds was they invited this person in, even if they didn't want to at times, and they would listen to him. They would offer him something to eat. And if you've ever been to my mom's house, there is an array of food that she would offer. She could feed the whole block or um, community. She was just good at hosting. And what little did I know was that my parents were sowing seeds of kindness and love into this person's life to give them an opportunity to talk about Jesus. And that's the beautiful thing about all of us in this room, including myself, is that if you sow seeds long enough, you will have an opportunity to speak Jesus into somebody's life. 
And so the interesting thing is, is that even my parents, I'll tell you this quick story, even my parents, I don't know if you ever got that phone call from a friend that you just couldn't get off the phone. And my parents, for those of you middle school students that are sitting in the room, um, I had this thing called a landline phone. Uh, you may not know what that is, uh, but I, I was an excited kid that would just love to pick up the phone and say hello. And sometimes I would get it before my mom would find out what it said on the caller ID. I'll never forget this one time she looked at the caller ID and I just picked it up and I said hello. And she's like, don't tell him I'm here. And I said, my mom told you to tell you that she's not here right now. And so, thank God you didn't have me as a, as a child. And so, our human nature is to see needs before anyone else's. And your brain will often send you signals when you've had enough of people. And at times, I think it's wise to listen to those um, signals and find a safe haven for rest and recharge. But what if, what if there was another signal? What if there was a signal that the Holy Spirit was prompting you to make? And what if there was a supernatural whisper where the Holy Spirit invites you on a journey that could change the way you see people and your purpose forever? And so it says in the book of Matthew, and we come across a time in Scripture where Jesus is traveling through Galilee, and he performed miracles, he spent time teaching in the synagogues, taking authority over um, evil spirits, and healing those who needed it most. And in chapter 9, we find a scene where Jesus is among the masses. And what's interesting, and so countercultural to our world, is that you don't see Jesus running from the crowds, hiding or asking his 12 to keep the people away from him. You actually see Jesus right in the very middle of the masses. And he used his God-designed power to change them. And so it says this in Matthew 9, verses 35 through 36. It says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And this is where we're going to camp today. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And so thought number one, if you're taking notes, is simply Jesus saw them. Jesus saw them. You might say, Pastor Chris, I don't see, I do see them actually, and they are annoying. Can't they just give Jesus some space? Why aren't they working right now? It's the hand that, that they've been dealt. Why don't they just suck it up and move on? And what we know to be true about God is he doesn't see people the way you and I see them. He sees them this way, which is found in 1 Samuel 16, 7. It says, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so the question is, if we were to see people the way Jesus does, what might that look like? Well, I believe it would look something like this. I'm a high school student who on the outside is pretty popular. I have a great deal of friends. I'm known as the cute one in my school and embrace it when hanging out in the public eye. But if you really knew me, you would know that my parents just divorced and I'm devastated. I'd, I try to put on a front as if it doesn't affect me, but if you really knew me, you would know that I'm angry, confused, and really just need someone to put their arm around me and say everything is going to be okay. I'm the lady at the cash register who just got your triple, half-sweet, non-fat caramel macchiato. And I politely took your card and asked how your day was, and you completely ignored me. It's okay. It's my job. I tend to hide my emotions really well, and I struggle daily with my self-worth. You would never know because I tend to hide my emotions very well. But at night, when no one is around, I often played the tape in my head of all the mistakes I've made in life. The next day, another shift starts, and I greet the person with a smile and welcome, only to realize that I'm ignored again. 
and my worthless value is confirmed. And I'm a businessman who goes by the slogan, work hard, play hard. I'm known for working long hours and even weekends if I need to. The world goes by 40 hours a week. Me, I don't hit my groove until 60. I spend most of my time pushing my team to hit their goals and make the most out of this business. And if people don't want to rise up to my level, I quickly dismiss them as someone who isn't ready for a challenge. But if you really knew me, you would know that I'm battling an addiction. I can't let others know because I'm afraid. I'll just hide behind my successes and work so nobody sees that I have a problem. And maybe you don't relate to any of these particular stories personally, but I can promise you that these stories are happening all around you. They're happening in the seat beside you. They're happening in the homes beside you. They're, they're happening in your subdivisions. They're absolutely happening within the context of the 419 area code. Jesus saw them, and his he saw them so he had compassion on them and it spurred him to action. It caused him to do something. Jesus could have come to earth, lived a perfect life, died for the sin of mankind, shed his blood, been buried and rose again, and he would have fulfilled his mission on earth of being the sacrificial lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. He didn't have to interact with individuals on concerning their day-to-day -day living, their day-to-day -day reality, their day-to-day -to -day hurts and fears and, and issues that they were wrestling with. He didn't have to, but he chose to. He interacted with them because he cared about them. Compassion drove him to make a difference in their present life. And in the 419 series, we're talking about making a difference in the lives that are right here around us and thought number one was Jesus saw them thought number two is that Jesus had compassion on them he had compassion on them see you and I we get to choose what we see and how we respond to what we see I am a proud driver of a wonderful truck but I had never been involved with cars before. I, I wasn't the guy in the, in the driveway, my dad and I working on cars. My dad and I crafted messages together. Cars weren't a part of my world in that regard. We just got from here to there in cars. And the only issue I had with trucks is they blocked the view I was trying to see as we were driving down the road when they were in front of me. And as soon as they moved out of the way, I was a happier person. And I quickly forgot about the truck. But one day I decided I wanted to drive a truck. And suddenly I saw every truck. I was studying trucks. There are a lot of beautiful trucks in our parking lot right now. I've seen a couple of them. And I praise the Lord that one of them is mine. <laughs> you see what you want to see. My focus shifted and suddenly I could see differently and that is the truth about every aspect of life if you look for happiness in this world you will find it if you look to be offended in this world you will find offense whatever you're looking for you're going to find it in your life we find what we're interested in and this begs the question Jesus had compassion on them because he saw them and the question is will you see them like he sees them will you choose to open up your eyes to see them will I choose because when Jesus saw them and had compassion on them it elicited a response from him he had to move he had to act compassion is a response born from truly seeing compassion wells up in your heart in your soul whenever you see something and it causes you to act upon what you've seen to try to make a difference. But it's also why, I think, we choose not to see at times. I'm as guilty as anyone. I will drive down the street. I will see at the stop sign or at the stop light half a mile before I get there because Ohio is flat and straight. <laughs> and I'll see that there's someone standing near the stoplight 
and they've got a cardboard sign in their hand. And I know it's going to say a couple of things. It's going to say need. It's going to say anything will help. It's going to say God bless. And as I drive up to that traffic light, if I think it's going to be red when I get there, I start making evasive decisions. I pull over to the left-hand side of the road, to the furthest lane away I can. That's step number one. If I don't have to turn left, I turn left anyway, if that's the fastest exit from this moment. Step number two, never make eye contact. Don't make eye contact, because if I see them, if, if I see them, it might cause me to respond. It might cause me to want to help. The third step is start rationalizing my lack of response. Oh, I, well, you know, I read an article one time that said there are people that uh, do that very same thing, that stand there on the side of the road with, with signs begging for help, and, and some of them actually make middle-class uh, middle, uh, incomes, and, and some of them own homes and cars, and this is, how, this is their work. This is what they do. They do this for 8 and 10 and 16 hours a day, and this is how they make their living. And, and some of them make a better living than, than people who actually work 9 to 5s every day of the week, and, 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 and I I've read one article in my life that said that, but, but I remember it very clearly in those moments. And then I think, well, this is actually dangerous, because what if they're in the road, and, 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 and how are the police allowing such dangerous activity to be happening at this stoplight? I'm just rationalizing the situation. I start praying for a green light, like they may be praying for food. Compassion is a response born from truly seeing. We choose not to see them because it, it stirs compassion and compassion drives action and, and I don't want to act because if I act, it means sacrifice. It, it, it means that I have to sacrifice the focus from me, what I want, what I need, what I desire, where I want to be at what time. Seeing them calls me to sacrifice attention and resource. If I see them, if I really see them and it stirs compassion, it means that I might have to show kindness to the one that might be striking out in anger toward me. If I, if I really see them. If I really see them, compassion may mean offering friendship to those who feel different or separated from others. That kid in school that doesn't sit with everybody else because they're always ridiculed, so they found their own place. If I really see them, it means I have to get up and go sit with them. Even if my friends wouldn't accept them at our table. If I really see them, it might mean sharing a kind word for those who serve. Even if they messed up the triple foam, half calf, whatever Pastor Chris said. And there's still kindness being offered. If I really saw them, compassion might drive me to offer a safe relationship for one battling addiction, or how about spending time with one who's lost a loved one? It's a sacrifice on our part. It's, it's something that we have to give of ourselves. But, and the question just is simply, why would we do that? Why would we give that? Why would we choose to see them when it's more convenient not to see them? And thought number three this morning is we see them because Jesus sees you. He sees you. He saw me. I don't deserve what I have but Jesus saw me I don't deserve the relationships that I have the wife that I have the kids that I have I don't, I don't but Jesus saw me I don't deserve salvation Ephesians 2 describes my life pretty well and it might describe yours once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. 
All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God. Anybody thankful for a but God moment in your life? But God. is so rich in mercy that he saw you. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. When he raised Christ from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Here's the secret. You know, I know, we know, we don't have it all together. We are jacked up people. You can be rich and jacked up. You can be poor and jacked up. You can be popular and jacked up. You can be unknown and unseen and jacked up. We're all jacked up people. The people that live next to us, the people that drive next to us, the people that sit next to us in church, all jacked up. The only difference between the jacked up person that is saved in Christ Jesus and the jacked up person that's not is that when you and I took on Christ as our Lord and Savior, his righteousness covered up our jacked upness. I know teachers had just broke out in hives. That's not a word, but it should be. And he's standing there with arms open wide saying, for everybody that my righteousness hasn't yet covered, I want to cover them. He saw you, he saw me, and compassion stirred within him. The Lord saw your heart and loves you anyway. He knew your thoughts and he accepted you anyway. He saw your deeds and he saved you anyway. And the question that you and I face today is, will we see them? When we see them, when we choose to see them, we are like Christ, seeing as only he can see them. So this school year, let us dedicate ourselves to seeing them. Students, in your classroom, open your eyes to see who's sitting around you. Maybe they've got everything you have and maybe they don't. But they have intrinsic value to God. And you are the light of Christ in their life right now. Will you see them? Let's give a soft answer when rage is presented. Let's show love when hate is revealed. Let's reach out when rejection really makes more sense. Let's offer kindness when anger would be understandable. Let's dedicate this year as, as a church, as students, as faculty, let's dedicate this year to making a difference in our community, knowing God sees them and choosing as individuals to see them. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Prayer partners, would you come forward? We're going to close this service in just a moment with an opportunity to pray as we worship. But Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I pray that you would give us the courage. The courage to choose to see those around us. Fear, anxiety, the fear of lack and the fear of failure rise up in our hearts. And we want to, we want to ignore those around us with, with great needs. Their needs may not be physical. Their needs may not be financial. But they have needs. I pray that you help us be a good friend to those who are struggling with addictions. I pray that you help us reach out with love to those who are filled with anger. I pray that you would give us the courage to say a kind word to those who are struggling in their moment. Put up our eyes and let us see them as you see them. In Jesus' name we pray. And let 
everybody say amen.